Welcome to the Real Comic Heroes Podcast. Your adventure into the world of comic book movies starts here. Greetings, citizens, and welcome to another adventure of the Real Comic Heroes Podcast. My name's Travis. Uh, no Patrick today. We're going to handle this one with uh, just myself and a guest. Uh, I think this is going to be the first James Bond movie that that Patrick wasn't here for. But oh, uh, in yeah. his in his stead, we have Eric Slater, a, a returning guest. So, Eric, welcome. Thank you so much for having me back. I uh, had yeah. a lot of fun last time with, uh, uh, what was it, first uh, first contact? Yeah, yeah. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Um, yeah, so we're just going to go through Tomorrow Never Dies, uh, the 1997, uh, the second outing for for Pierce Brosnan as uh, 007. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's start with uh, with history. What uh, what can you tell me about your history with this one? Sure. Uh, so this was actually the first one I saw in theaters um, and it was. Uh, you know, like this was kind of the beginning of my Bond fandom in a way. Like I had played Goldeneye, I had, you know, seen the movie and stuff on on VHS or whatever. But like seeing this on the big screen, like really kind of sucked me in at the time, you know. Yeah. Um, and then I went back, like rented all the old ones, got really into the Connery stuff. And, you know, I've, um, you know, since like read a bunch of the books, you mm. know, I've definitely become a Bond fan over the years. Um, and sure, like a lot of the movies uh, aren't great, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it, it's kind of like being like a fan of like old school Star Trek. You got to yeah. just accept that it's very of its time and some of it didn't age super well. But like even yeah. the bad stuff can be fun. Like there's that <laughs> cheesy quality to it. Mm -hmm. um, and Tomorrow Never Dies is an interesting one because it kind of like toes the line between serious and, and hokey right. at times uh for better or worse which we'll get into you know uh maybe less is more but you know mm, yeah <laughs> uh but yeah de this was definitely like um it's not my favorite bond movie by any means but okay. it was definitely like a big one as far as like this was my introduction you know in a big way you know uh mine uh, i'm pretty similar then because this was would have been the first bond movie that i saw in theater i saw it with my dad and that guy had seen GoldenEye on VHS before this, but yeah, I, I really wasn't a big into Bond either. This might have been, you know, I think GoldenEye and this would have been the first two that I saw. I don't think I'd really seen many of them, uh, if any of them, before these. So yeah, yeah. So there's a nostalgia factor for 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 me with this one, seeing it with with my dad and uh, for sure. um. But uh, yeah, I mean, and it's not one that I've revisited much, but we'll get into it. But I had a good time with this one. Yeah. So it's it's very 90s, like aggressive. Oh, sure. 90s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I kind of appreciate. It like, kind of makes the movie better in a way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It, I, I, I feel like like you were saying, it rides that line between serious and campy Brosnan. Like I, it does have a nice mixture of. Like it feels like it's it's that Dalton era ninety yeah. late eighties you know Bond. It's got some. I found some Connery moments in in what Pierce was doing, and then of course there's some Roger Moore ish uh, campiness yeah. and one liners <laughs> and stuff like that. So I, I yeah I think it's a good mixture of a Bond movie. I would almost if you were gonna show someone like you know pick one movie for each actor i might go with this one over really? uh over a golden eye just as far as like mm -hmm. what do you need to see to to experience a, a bond movie maybe this one i don't know i i, I see where you're coming from with that because it does kind of go through the checklist mm -hmm. like right. every single thing that you expect from the franchise yeah. is in this movie uh it's it's the most stereotypical bond movie in a weird way might be uh, yeah yeah <laughs> um but yeah well, cool. Um, I, we've got some uh, thoughts and, and comments from listeners who who shared kind of their thoughts on on this movie. And we've got two. Um, coincidentally, they're both from people named Rob and they are like, oh, wow, sp they're split 50 50 on mm. like one really likes it. One doesn't really care for it much. So we have a nice, you know, and I'll probably uh, agree with both of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Probably. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we'll see which Rob, uh, wins at the end of the episode as far as, you know, 
where we what we feel about it, what we rate it. So let me uh, play. Uh, we'll start with Rob O'Connor. Hey, guys, it's Rob O'Connor here from the All Star Super Fan Podcast. Uh, just wanted to chime in with my thoughts on Tomorrow Never Dies. It's actually one of my favorite James Bond movies. Uh, everybody always talks about how great Goldeneye is. And yeah, look, Goldeneye is a great film. I think it did a great job of kind of revamping James Bond at a time when it wasn't as popular as it once was. But I think Tomorrow Never Dies, on the other hand, is just a kick-ass movie. It's so much fun from start to finish. Jonathan Price is incredible. Pierce Brosnan is just eating up every single scene. He's just the coolest man in the world. Uh, obviously, goes without saying, Wei Lin, Michelle Yeoh is just incredible in every single scene. So glad that she's gone from strength to strength ever since. Shout out to Terry Hatcher, by the way. Everyone makes one of her in this movie. I think she's pretty good. And you know what? She was Lois Lane in my favorite version of Superman ever, Lois and Clark. Uh, so that has to count for something. Uh, really looking forward to the discussion. Hope you guys enjoy the movie as much as I did. I suspect that you possibly didn't. Uh, but there you go. Thanks very much. All-Star Super Fan Podcast signing off. Nice. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, thank you, uh, Rob. Rob also does a Dick Tracy minute. Um, those those come out a little less frequently. But, uh, but thank you, Rob. And then next we have uh, from Movie Rob. Hey everyone, this is Rob from Movie Rob Minute. Well, Tomorrow Never Dies. All right, that's it's actually one of the weaker James Bond movies. It does have a great theme song by Sheryl Crow, which obviously is one of the final points of this movie. Pierce Brosnan once again shows that that he looks perfect in the part of James Bond, but unfortunately the stories are just never as good. Jonathan Price is a little laughable as the villain here. He's supposed to be a menacing megalomaniac like most of the Bond villains, but he just doesn't, he's not able to, to pull that one off. So yeah, I gotta say this is one of the weakest Bond films, but again, it's always fun checking them out, watching Bond films, because you, you know what you're getting with them. It does have some great James Bond type quotes. But yeah, it's it's one you can still check out. You can have a fun time with, even though it just doesn't really work as well as one would hope for. So finding me is very simple. Just do, do a search for Movie Around Minute. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter, or you can go to my website, moviearoundminute.com. I'm currently in season five of my podcast. I'm currently doing Minute by Minute Die Hard 2. In the past, I've done The, the Great Escape. I've done Planes, Trains, Automobiles, Die Hard 1, When Harry Met Sally, and now we're in the middle of the fifth season. Thank you, Travis, for the artwork the past few seasons. And I will not be doing Tomorrow Never Dies, though. Sorry for anyone who was hoping that at some point I would do that. Yippee-ki-yay! <laughs> nice. I gotta check that out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when Harry Met Sally and Die Hard. That's, right. that's an interesting mix. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> My favorite part of that, that clip is he says, uh, When Harry Met... Or, uh, Die Hard One when Harry met Sally. So it's, it sounds like it's the the colon that you know to the the <laughs> subtitle to Die Hard One is little known uh, when Harry met Sally. So yeah, when Hans um, met Bruce. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but again, thank you, uh, Robs, for submitting those those thoughts. Uh, like I said, it's uh, they're on both sides pretty much. So we'll see uh, see where we land at the end of this. Yeah. So the movie I mean, starts with uh, I f- I feel like this is it starts with the classic gun barrel, it whereas does. Goldeneye they did they tweaked something with it like the bullet you see the bullet coming at you and it does like a CGI thing and mm-hmm. you know it's a it's a little extra whereas this one it's it's just a classic well, the, gun barrel. Well, and the Goldeneye gun barrel specifically had that weird like techno beat that I don't yes. think quite worked you know mm-hmm. it kind of it's the one part of that movie that kind of throws me off oh yeah i freaking love goldeneye but i don't like the gun barrel sequence in that one and this yeah. one nailed it this is one mm-hmm. of the best uh because it's it's just exactly what it needs to be it's, yeah. it's perfect you know it's yeah yeah it looks polished but like it's not too much right mm-hmm. it, again it's it's a classic you know you're it, you're che- checking off that that list of, of yes. classic things that this movie has and then we go to the, of course, the opening sequence, and I'm a little disappointed that it starts with text on screen, and you know, 
a ter- oh. a terrorist arms bazaar on the Russian border. You know, like yeah. you could have told us that without putting that on screen. Um, True, it's a little I, bit much. If it had said, especially near... since they literally say it later right. on, you right? Know? <laughs> like in context, yeah, like yeah. Um, had it just said near the ter- near the Russian border, and then we find out, oh, this is a terrorist uh, arms bazaar. It's a it's a shopping market for. You know, it's a black market kind of sale. Totally. You know, I think that might have worked a little bit better. Um, but that having been said, I think this is up there for one of my favorite opening sequences of a Bond movie. It's a perfect little action film oh, yeah. uh, from start to finish. I mean, it sets you up nicely with, OK, we've got shady people making shady deals. Then we have MI6 and they're able to view all this you know, someone is is there uh, with a with a camera, and then you know Bond shows up, and, and I think it and just all hell breaks loose. Exactly, <laughs> we find out. Like, I totally agree. I think this is like top five cold opens, maybe. Like, it's up there. Yeah. I uh, you know we'll get into it. But I don't think the movie itself is quite up there, but like this whole first, like the opening 10, 20 minutes, however long it is, is like just nonstop action. And it really like gets you like pulls mm-hmm. you in immediately. Um, and I also love when Bond movies have a cold open that has like almost nothing to do with the rest of the movie. And that's right. kind of the, the thing here. Uh, there is a one very subtle connection to the rest of the movie and it's easy to miss it if you're not looking for it but i like i I, I like it. it stands on its own it's great yeah yeah we get a quick glimpse at uh one of the minor henchmen in the movie you got ricky J uh playing uh henry gupta and he's there acquiring this little device that's going to be part of the it's it's essentially is the MacGuffin for it is um, a good chunk of the movie yeah, Henry or uh, Ricky Jay is one of those that guy actors. He's been in everything. He's t- closely tied in with. He was. He's he's passed a, a few years ago. Uh, oh, that's right. Very into like the magician community. Um, yeah, he's he's like uh, he's a typically he is a uh, consultant on, on any movie that deals with you know close up magic and, and magic tricks and things like that. But he was also in Deadwood. You know, as yeah. Powers Booth's like right hand man, um, he's been in a lot of stuff. So, oh yeah, yeah. In fact, there's actually a deleted scene where he was supposed to like throw trick cards at one point, oh. and that's like why they cast him. But that scene mm. didn't end up in the movie. Man. But during one of the the tests, he actually threw it at Pierce Bro- Brosnan's face, hit him in the forehead. <laughs> man, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, well, I I really like the code names that are being thrown around here. Uh. Someone says, uh, you know, white rook to white knight, you know, referring to Bond as the white knight. Um, I think it was kind of fun. And, yeah, that was brilliant. Uh, yeah. We don't get that a lot in these movies. Yeah, think yeah. that kind of thing would be commonplace, you know, code words right. and all that. But yeah. Something odd, I thought, once once the shit kind of hits the fan and they're about to, they've, they've authorized this, you know, missile strike on this whole air base. Mm-hmm. And then they find out, that one of the planes that will be hit ha- is carrying some nuclear ordnance, and yeah. then that's what you know kicks things into gear. Bond then has to remove these nukes from the playing field, and of course the uh, the British military can't recall their missiles; they can't abort them. And yeah. they uh, before I guess before that, when they launch everything, there's a quick shot of the the naval vessel. Switching a flip or flipping a switch to from peace to war, <laughs> I thought was a very weird thing. I didn't thing. catch that. Wow. Yeah, it's a quick little inset <laughs> shot. It made oh me actually God. look and see is there is that based on anything? That, that, that would be weird. Yeah. So the closest thing I could find is um, on some airplane, like on uh, like fighter jets, mm. will have a war and peace switch that when they flip that switch it allows their planes to go faster you know makes them a little bit more responsive more thrust longer radar detection that sort of thing so it that seems plausible um i thought it was just a a throwaway thing just for the movie but it might be based in some some reality there 
That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I do love the fact that we get like the uh, the HQ, you know, like mm-hmm. like MI six headquarters and all the um the interplay, the back and forth, you know, like kind of you get to see like the behind the scenes like politics going yeah. on behind this, and it does feel a little bit more real world than some of the older movies where yeah. It was just like Bond against the world. Like, no, he's just a small part of this larger operation. Yeah. Um, but I like that he's just undercover there. He just happens to be there. And then when the situation gets out of hand, that's when he steps in and does his, yeah. you know, his Bond thing and fucks everything up. <laughs> well, and even we're we're so used to M being the mm-hmm. top dog in these in these movies. Everything that right. you know, Bond has to run everything through M. Mm-hmm. And then you quickly find out like she is is just one of many like you know heads of departments that are you know you've got the which makes sense yeah yeah you've got the the minister of defense is in this little sequence he's played by yeah. julian fellows of yeah. uh downton abbey and and you know upstairs downstairs all that you know yeah. british tv fame sure. um there's like an admiral here you know that that seems on the on the same level maybe as m but yeah so it's interesting to see m not being at the very top and and running everything so for sure also the return of judy dench is m Mm -hmm. oh yeah so good in all these movies of course but i love what they did with her character in this one you know yeah Uh, we get to see that you know when we when we're introduced to her in goldeneye she's very like she doesn't take any shit from bond which is great yeah uh, but I like it how at this point she kind of respects him a little bit more and they're kind of, you know, they understand each other a little bit better mm-hmm. and they actually like work well together during the yeah. like, briefing scene. They don't have that many scenes together, but it is, yeah. it is good. It's very notable. Yeah. Um, another thing, uh, I'm not going to go through every beat of the action in, in this. I mean, Bond eventually fights a bunch of guys. He steals a plane, you know, he starts to make off with the plane. You know, he's got the, the backseat driver, of the plane is knocked out. He's there's he another knocks pl- him out with another helmet. <laughs> yes. That was great. It was yeah. so cheesy. Yeah. Um, so he's in the plane and, and the, the backseat guy is starting to, to come to and strangle him and bond ejects yeah. him with the, with the backseat guys, uh, canopy or, uh, ejection seat. Yeah. And that was another thing I had to look up cause it looked weird mm-hmm. to me that a, the, just the back, portion of the canopy ejected yeah. with him and so i i had to look that up like i'm yeah, used to like cool. top gun being you know the entire canopy goes off yeah um, as one piece but uh yeah apparently uh some planes have have a split canopy and and it will do exactly as as shown here where wow. just the back will release and the pilot can stay in and it keeps the can the doesn't keep cabin pressure but right <laughs> it's still you know at least the front guy still has a windscreen for you know whatever yeah but, uh, that's interesting yeah but uh yeah it's a it, like i said it's a fun action scene uh I, I think it's a perfect little opening sequence for a bond movie so oh yeah yeah definitely it's non-stop and it really sets the tone <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah um as far as like opening credits go this one's fine to me there's a lot of x-rays yeah. there's a lot of like Printed circuits, uh, close ups on uh, close up on circuits, you know, circuitry, that sort of thing. Couldn't really uh, tell what how that fits with the overall theme <laughs> of the movie. It really doesn't, I don't think. But it's it's establishing that this is the late nineties. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is like the beginning of the internet age. I guess mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm stretching here, but like, uh, I mean. It it feels like it, I don't think it aged super well, especially with like the the CGI lady. Like that didn't look that great. Yeah, um, but I don't know. Yeah, I guess I don't have that many thoughts on this one. It's just yeah, it's just generic as hell. Right, <laughs> the Bond opening, you know. Um, but it does <laughs> have and, yeah, yeah. It does have the Cheryl Crow song, which I do think is uh, it's held in higher regard than the movie. Like like mm-hmm. uh, movie Rob said that uh, that. I think he thinks the the song is better than the the whole movie as a whole. Um, I will say with the title, like tomorrow never dies, it's kind of impressive that she managed to make a song out of that. Oh yeah. All the good ones do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Um, 
Yeah, and this was like totally a trend at this point because it's like, I mean, in some of the newer ones, they don't even bother trying to fit the title in. But right. like, like this is almost like you have to do this. You have to work the title mm -hmm. into the into the song every time. Um, yeah. Interesting note about the title, though. It was originally mm -hmm. called Tomorrow Never Lies. Right. And it was a typo on one of the scripts <laughs> and the producer was like, hey, we like I like that. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I read that it came through a uh, through a fax. And oh, okay. maybe looked a little the the D looked or the L looked uh, a little distorted. So yeah, it was someone interpreted it as dies instead of lies. Um, yeah. Both would be good titles. Um, I I like the yeah. title as it is, but tomorrow never lies. I think is also a decent title. Sure. Um, back to the song. Like for me, I don't think this is a memorable song. Yeah. The way that a uh, you know Goldfinger, uh, Diamonds Are Forever. It's Man got with a golden gun. Yeah, yeah, for sure. To me, this one just is like, oh yeah, th that's what this song sounds like. You know, <laughs> I, I think the yeah. same thing with the next movie uh, with uh, uh, Shirley oh, Manson. Garbage song. Garbage. Yeah, I yeah. think the same thing with that one. I like the song, but it's very forgettable, I think. Mm. But uh, yeah, um, this one is directed by Roger Spottiswood. Spottiswood. Um he he wanted to be a director, and so uh, another director, Walter Hill, advised Roger that if he wanted to direct, then he needed to write something. And so he and Walter Hill worked together on uh, 48 Hours, the Nolte, Eddie Murphy oh. buddy movie. And then Roger would go on to direct uh, Turner and Hooch, Air America, uh, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. Uh, then he, you know, he does this movie, and then the last thing that I recognize by by name is the uh, 2000 uh, Schwarzenegger movie, The Sixth Day. Um, oh, so okay, that's also not great, but yeah, I do remember it vaguely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so then we've got uh, movie opens with uh, I think it's some is a news. Oh, oh yeah, we cut to the South China Seas, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We we get that one sequence, which I feel like goes on a little too long for what it is. Right. But they're kind of trying to like set up the whole plot of the movie with uh, yeah. I think it's a British naval ship mm -hmm. that's then attacked. Um, and they yeah. believe it's the Chinese. Right. It's, it's setting up yeah. the British versus the Chinese. Initially, the movie was going to be. Uh, so when this was the writing for this movie first started, it was going to involve a plot to destroy Hong Kong um, as oh. the, the transfer of British British rule from China was very recent, but then yeah, that's very topical because this time. movie was coming out in November, I think mm. they uh, and, and that whole transfer of ownership happened in July. They just thought we've missed that mark. There's no way to, we can't we can't move the movie up six months and get it done in time, so they right. abandoned that whole idea. And then a writer named uh, uh, Bruce uh, Fire Firestein came on board and turned in a draft, and he was inspired by his time as a journalist during oh. the the Gulf War and seeing that whole twenty four hour news cycle of uh, yeah. I think it said like having Skynet and CNN and like all these <laughs> competing news agencies and a little bit of the you know maybe misinformation or oh, or yeah. just just that 24 hour news cycle was a big like let's make a movie centered around that and <clears throat> you know so that's well, that's kind of how this movie started so. it is insane when you read about the behind the scenes of this movie because like they didn't have a finished script right it sounds like it was just pure chaos the entire time mm -hmm. and at the end of the day you can't tell like it's no, it's yeah. actually really well constructed. Like it works, and it's kind of surprising how it all came together at the end. Yeah, when you when you find that out, especially like what six month window? That's nuts. Like for rewrites and stuff. Yeah, it's the whole plot of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I love about this plot, um, is that it is it sounded really dumb at the time, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, but today it sounds prophetic. You know, it really right. feels yeah. like. They were on to something, you know, <laughs> um, something about a news, news information and yeah, news company having fake news. Yeah, yeah, right. that's uh, <laughs> it's pretty topical now. Yeah, sure. um, 
I don't have the the facts in front of me, but a lot of people assume that that uh, Jonathan Price's character was based on Rupert Murdoch, but I read mm. it was actually based on someone else from like forty years earlier or something like that. I can't remember that person's name, but sure. Um, oh, Robert Maxwell might be the one. Might be. Yeah, because I read something about. There's a line at the end where M makes a quip about uh you know like she was like making up a cover story mm-hmm. that he like yeah. died from suicide on his yacht yeah and that's what happened to robert maxwell okay. i believe his name is yeah yeah that who sounds... was also like one of those shady you know right corporate douchebags <laughs> yeah yeah um the the scene that we open then from the credits with the you've got the two you know the british and, and chinese ships and then you have this other vessel um coming in and you know stealing or they use this drill to attack yeah. one ship and it goes in you know it it can twist or it can turn it's a little mini submarine really yeah um this would be its own uh opening sequence sort of scene in in sure. you know, um but they go to like the missile room and and that feels very bonded i think uh, Thunderball and yep. Spy Who Loved Me. I mean, there were several early Bond movies that opened with similar things of like, you know, stealing a nuclear warhead from a ship and, and yeah. that being that being the the villain's like, you know, main weapon or something like that. So Exactly. At, at first I was a little confused with the whole sea drill and like, why not just shoot a missile at it, you know? But then I realized, right. oh, you need to you first you need you need something from the ship, so that's why you don't blow it up. You right. you want them, you want to sink the ship and disable it, but you also want to give them time to to uh, send out a distress call and and oh. blame you know this other uh, nation for what what's happening to them. So it is pretty convoluted when you think about the logistics of this plan and how absurd yeah. it all is. But yeah. yeah. There is a uh, a baby Gerard Butler is part of the British crew. Uh, That's right. Old Jerry Butler himself. He's just one of the crewmen of the of whatever this British ship is. Yeah, he gets um, red shirted. Yeah. So then, uh, then we meet uh, Jonathan Price's uh, Elliot Carver and kind of does this news roundup sort of thing with some of his, you know, I'm not sure who they all are, his constituents and yeah. Um, He's a whole cabal of media moguls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess. What do, What do you think about Price as the villain here? I I like him, but I think he's in the wrong movie. He okay. feels like a Roger Moore Bond villain. You know, like he's yeah. so over the top. He's chewing up every freaking scene, but yeah. he does it really well. And um, yeah, I don't know. He he just he's not like he's not. I don't know. He's giving it his all, I guess. He you is. Know? He's having fun with it. He absolutely. He's a little too Doctor Evil for me. Right. Yeah, it is, he, is getting it, into like that spoof territory. Yes, you know, <laughs> because he is almost getting off on. Oh, aren't I so evil? You know, right. it's almost that. Like he, again, like like let's he's pull a, it back a little bit. Like, yeah, a better director would probably like take him aside. But... Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I never understand. I guess it's 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 ego that is driving him, right? You know, and but he wants to build this empire, but I don't know who he wants to leave it to, and right. what this legacy that he want like he's already sixty years old. I'm guessing how yeah. much of this you know media empire are you going to have firsthand you know <laughs> you know control over and it doesn't seem like you have any heirs right. you know anything like that so I, I don't get the sense that he's someone that wants to pass this on to anyone else but so why care if if you have r- broadcasting rights in china <laughs> for a hundred years you know yeah i, and I, I don't love that that's under- the crux of his plan too yeah um i don't really get him that's that's my main problem with him is i don't know other than just i guess vanity yeah, and I, th- I mean, you see his face everywhere. Yeah, so that's probably what it is. He probably yeah. just wants a statue or something. I don't yeah, know. I, I just feel like they Maybe could he... have tweaked that a little bit, you know? 
Yeah. I just always assume that he's one of those types that assumes he'll just like crowd freeze himself or whatever. <laughs> right. You know, and yeah. maybe get revived in a hundred years. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it is very weird. But what's hilarious about his plan is that his plan is all about newspapers. Mm -hmm. And just a few yeah. years later, like that whole industry is sure. gonna tank, you know. So But he is um, he does have some diverse diversification true. there. Um as yeah. he's talking to his, you know, other like his his subordinates one says you know oh the new tablet is out and we've yeah. already got bugs in it so the next version will be so <laughs> the versions will require that's too them real to world. buy <laughs> yes yes so i do think obviously yes this this movie gets a reputation for it centering around a newspaper mogul but sure. he's got his fingers in enough other you know t technologies to, that will survive the newspaper sort of yeah. uh he'll probably be like like he hit carver was it carver corporation carver industries carver or something media group carver media group that like that, that would be like aol in the bond universe yeah. basically yeah <laughs> um, aol time warner or whatever yeah yeah <laughs> it'd be funny if as he was going through that you know uh the talking heads that he's he's giving orders to if one of them had said you know you know, throw out a name or whatever and you know, ask them like how is my uh my uh cloning facility doing and like, oh we've got some good you know <laughs> good uh viable uh host you know bodies or you know something like yeah. th that would be fun to that would because i would cool believe touch. Yeah. i would believe that this guy is is going down that path yeah definitely definitely we meet uh bond we we catch up with bond at this uh it's like uh, i don't know if it's like oxford but it's it's some university and going down on a woman yeah <laughs> as he does yeah yeah um it might be the sexiest bond scene that i could think of it's definitely up there it's well shot for sure yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, and it's kind of clever you know like you know it's it's cheesy again but mm -hmm. like you know i could see that line working <laughs> yeah but uh yeah he gets called in so then we cut to a meeting with uh you know, M and and maybe the Admiral again. And this might be where we first see Julian Fellows as the Minister mm -hmm. of Defense and just everyone going over, you know, what happened and, and everything. And they bring Bond in. Um, we do have a sequence in this where someone has to explain what GPS is, you know, global positioning yeah. <laughs> satellite. I'm almost surprised that, I mean, it's that same era of having to explain what an EMP is. Yes. You know. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. Like the audience might not understand otherwise. Yeah. Um, and then from here, we basically get the main uh, thrust of the movie, essentially. They have 48 hours before uh, the British you know, roll in to China with with warships, you know. The, right. Which because is a solid. It's a solid ticking clock. For sure. It's a, it's a believable enough time, you know. Yeah, forty eight hours is a good uh, amount of time to to carry something like this out. It's it, I think it's believable. Some some movies I think have too short a window of mm. everything has to happen in eight hours, and but it feels like it's yeah. taking place over a couple of days or whatever. So right, yeah, this this feels right. I think <laughs> I do think um, the pacing is pretty good in the movie, but honestly, I even though this is one of the shortest Bond movies, it feels like they could have cut a little bit more fat off of it. Yeah, and get it like you know, going a little faster, you know? I thought so too. I'll bring up a couple examples of that later on. Yeah. And we get something that, that I don't, we don't get enough of is a uh, cue in the field. I think Bond yes. is at an airport, I think, mm -hmm. or maybe he's just landed in, uh, in Was Hamburg. Hamburg. Okay. I, yeah. It, it, this may be Berlin. I don't know if there's, a, yeah, I don't know. A, you know, um, I think it's Hamburg though. I know that's where uh, Carver, is based out of anyways, mm. at least for this portion of the movie. Um, but yeah, we get Q, you know, it's a fun little sequence where Bond goes to get, pick up his rental car and up walks, you know, Desmond Llewellyn and his red jacket and his giant yep. hands. <laughs> yes. Uh, as far as Q scenes go, this might be one of my favorites. Okay. I, uh, I just think the humor here is really good. Yeah. Um, it, it kind of, it kind of fits, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of cheesy lines in this movie, but mm -hmm. this scene, I think totally like he sells it, you know? Yeah. I, I think these two, you know, you got they've only, they, they do. And I, you know? I mean, surely there was a Q scene in GoldenEye, right? I just oh can't, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's actually, I think that one tops this one. That's okay. The one where he he's in the wheelchair and has the cast that right ends up in a bazooka. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, you get his whole crazy lab. You know. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, but for only having now the one movie under their belts, yeah, they have a good rhythm. Uh, they feel uh like a good pair. I think. Um, for sure. Yeah, it but, feels uh, like old colleagues catching. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> like and and the fact that um, Q lists off this like insurance policy, and he's like calling <laughs> yes. him out for destroying all his vehicles. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's great. Fire insurance? Oh, probably. <laughs> Loss of life? Well, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, we get the uh, the BMW 750i, I think. Yes. IL maybe. Um, which that reveal. Yeah. Um, it this is one of the most dated things about the movie because like that looks like it doesn't look great like <laughs> it's a family sedan you know right yeah uh, but I remember at the time being like oh cool mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah it's high tech looking but like it just looks like an old car <laughs> you know, yeah. like an old shitty car <laughs> <laughs> uh but it's a lot of fun though when Q gets out that that yeah erickson phone flip phone you know and he's like slow like draw your finger along this pad and the the car's jerking and you know he's obviously not good at this but bond just takes it over and just you know perfectly executes you know the the driving this car it's fun i will say that's one of my complaints about Mm. this version of bond is that he's perfect at everything okay they don't make him flawed enough you know like like yeah he picks it up immediately like right. really like you know um but again i mean it's still fun and this movie works but i feel like that ends up becoming a problem for mm-hmm. me at least with pierce brosnan's bronson no brosnan i always yeah. get that mixed up yeah <laughs> we did a whole season of um bond movies for podcasters assemble mm. and i always misspoke his name so everyone always like yeah. makes fun of me <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah no that's just you know as these brosnan movies go on you know it's like that that becomes more of a thing is that yeah. he just has no flaws as far as like he could pick up anything you know <laughs> yeah that, that's fair yeah um yeah and then it we transition to this uh, kind of a gala party, you know, uh, a launch, some event that the, the Carver Media Group is launching their 24 hour, you know, their new network or, or whatever. Yeah. And uh, we meet uh, Terry Hatcher, you know, as as Paris Carver, of course, every most I think mostly known from from uh, playing Lois Lane and, and Lois and Clark. Definitely you know, this stand is, out from that series, too. Yeah. 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 Um, I like her. I think uh, totally. she brings something to this movie that you don't always get, and it's it's a she's a classy lady. Yes, you know, I mean, you get that with your uh, Maude Adams in Man with the Golden Gun. She Man was Man with in. the Golden Gun, yeah, and Octopus. Well, she was also in Octopus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm thinking of like her from that, and then um, oh, from the Spy Who Loved Me, uh, Barbara Brock. Barbara Bach, mm, um, definitely. But uh, she has kind of up there, I think, with with them. Maybe not the in terms of performance, but uh, uh, she's she's definitely one of the better Bond girls from like at least the first twenty movies. Because obviously, mm-hmm. we get like Vesper Lynn later on, and oh she's sure, like one of the best characters ever written in the in these movies. Yeah, but uh, considering how little she's in the movie, she right. really makes an impact. And I love the fact that they have this history prior to this. Yeah. I almost wish that her character was in like one of the previous movies, you know, right. that would have like ha- had a lot more weight to it. Yeah. But um, I really, really like her character and what they did with her. I mean, it was sad. It was tragic, but like yeah. it was earned, I think, you know? Yeah. I, I fully agree that I, I like the backstory. Um, that's not something you get. My, this might be the only instance where he's, you know, the, these two, you know, the Bond and then the first lady that he meets in the movie are uh, familiar. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like a really cool twist as yeah. far as, um, you know, this movie doesn't do a lot of new things, but at least there's that. You yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> as far as the Bond formula goes. Um, right. But I do want to call out this whole scene, the set mm-hmm. design, mm-hmm. the lighting, the costuming is all like 
top tier i think sure this is like i think such a great scene as far as visuals uh the lasers in the background like it's yeah. a really cool set you know yeah they did some cool stuff with it and her her outfit's awesome his outfit's great mm. uh it's it's on point so yeah points there for sure uh we get you know carver shows up looking like a i mean almost looking like a, a dr no or um a Blofeld, you know, a just with the... instead of wearing wearing white, he's in black, but it's still mm -hmm. that. Uh, what are they called? The Nehru jacket? Yeah, I think so. That's, yeah, it's got the buttons like all the way up. Yeah, the collar. Yeah, definitely. Um, he, yeah, he looks like a he's a good villain in this. I mean, you know, despite what we've yeah you know, <laughs> playing it up, but he he looks like a villain. You know, so for sure. Um, we also get a. a we we meet Michelle Yeoh's Wei Lin here. Uh, I don't get much of her here, um, but you know she gets introduced. She crashes the party. She and Bond meet as you know Bond playing the, the some banker. He's playing type a banker. character, <laughs> um, but she looks great. That she's wearing a silver dress that, that looks really cool. Yeah, um, she stands out for sure. Definitely, and it's a really good introduction because we don't right away we don't know what her deal is. Because she's also a spy, but she's introduced as like a, a news reporter or something. From China, From where China. Carver has no, you know, jurisdiction, jurisdiction. you know. So that is, that is an interesting, you know, reason for her character to be here. And, and yeah. Um, yeah. So then, of course, you know, Bond starts to lay it on a bit thick, as Bond does. You know, he's getting point blank... <laughs> basically insinuating that uh that Elliot you know has has done something has has caused this you know the whole situation with the British warship and you know causing <laughs> it to be where it shouldn't be and, and that sort of thing so clearly just you know overplaying yeah. his hand and it's another instance of Bond just being the worst spy ever <laughs> absolutely like uses his real name of course you know, yeah, just spills all the beans about like I'm on to you. You know, <laughs> it's like such. It's yeah. not even like he's trying. You know, with the cover yeah. story and stuff. You know, <laughs> it's interesting to me though that Carver then has his goons. You know, detain Bond, yes. and normally in a Bond movie they would run his. You know, uh, do a background check on him, and then they would find out that he's James Bond. But right. here, like, they don't find out he's James Bond, you know, British agent until, like, the next day. So yeah. Carver was going to have his guys. I don't know that they were going to go as far as killing him, but the they were at message. least... It was like a mafia movie. You yes. Know? <laughs> and I also thought it was funny that he, he his gang of henchmen are these geriatric, <laughs> you know, one of them looks like Carl Reiner from Ocean's Eleven. I, I'm not sure that it's not Carl Reiner. <laughs> I was kind of worried for these henchmen. Yeah, like during that fight scene, I was like, "Oh no, it, it's break a so hip. it's so bizarre." Like, get some <laughs> young goons. Um, the one thing I do like about that scene, though, is that they go to a soundproof room, <laughs> which would make yeah. sense because of the whole media thing, you know, like uh, they have. That's yeah, like, like a recording studio. booth, yeah. You know, because there are instruments in that room. There's like a cello and different things. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah, there's a guard. Bond even uses a piano to smash guys' oh. head in, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, so, yeah, that that all makes sense. Um, of course, Bond gets out of it, you know, and, and you've got the the main henchman, Stomper, who's mm -hmm. who's he's great. He's cut from the uh, Red Grant sort of cloth yes. um, and, and several other, you know, great henchmen from these movies. Um, Definitely. he's basically in charge of this whole situation, but he's not there. So mm -hmm. it all goes to shit and, and <laughs> he'll get the blame for it later. And of course, but Bond gets away. I'm trying to think, Oh, he gets himself into a little room with a like fuse panel. You know, he can basically That's turn, right. turn off some, pull some fuses or something and completely ruins, uh, Elliot Carver's, you know, big, big night, uh, yeah. sort of thing. Um, and then there's a, a perfect little joke tagged onto that where it's the news cycle, maybe that night, maybe I think it's probably that night. Um, some of the other networks, you know, are, are commenting on how Carver's uh, rollout didn't go so well. And and the guy yeah. says, sorry, Elliot, we didn't do it. You know, just, <laughs> it's just a nice little uh, added definitely, thing. Definitely, definitely. 
Um, then we go to Bond in his hotel, and there's a great moment that you don't all you don't often get. I know we've had before, where it's Bond like sitting in a dark corner in a chair with a bottle of of vodka next to him and his gun, and it's it's very Connery. Yes. I, there I can I can <clears throat> it might be Doctor No. Um, it might have been one of the later ones. Um. Where Connery sits sits in a chair waiting, you know, but he's got his his booze and he's got his gun. And I think he even like holds the the ice in the the glass like up to his forehead, like he's just been through some shit, you know. And it's just finally yeah. like, I just need a moment. I'm just gonna sit here, you know. That felt <clears throat> very real. It was yeah, one of those. Yeah, I like I like that moment a lot because we don't get a lot of those kind of scenes in these movies typically. Yeah, and then I feel like it's the next morning that uh, Paris comes in. She, you know, uh, there might have been a scene there where uh, Elliot goes to, yeah, the, yeah, because Elliot goes to Paris, his wife, and, you know, because yeah. Gupta has told Carver, like, oh, I've got this audio footage of uh, Bond and Paris On the balcony, chatting. Right? Yeah. yeah, and clearly they have history, so Carver goes to his wife and says, go to Bond and seduce him. I mean, basically, it sounds like he wants wants her to get information um i'm not sure what his plan there was like in yeah. retrospect because like the way things yeah. turn out later like was she always but i don't know you know like was he just planning on having them both killed like i think so i think he wanted yeah. them in the same room together so that, that he could carry out his high up loose ends kind yeah. of yeah um but yeah no you're right that is a little vague on what he wanted to send her there for but right because yeah. it's bond mm -hmm. you know <laughs> sorry yeah <laughs> you know yeah um they have a little you know there's a little sex scene the start of a sex scene with them and it's again like bond is a yeah. biter he he <laughs> that's something yeah. that i think he just does in his when he's doing a sex sure. scene pierce brosnan like he likes to do the like the the little bites you know yeah. bites her shoulder and with the lady at the beginning of the movie there was some like soft biting there too like i think it's just what what pierce thinks <laughs> is sexy you know sure yeah. so i, I mean, mean it, it plays well but yeah i you know again this is a, one of the better like kind of you know he's the most kind of scenes you know? yeah yeah <laughs> i think out of any of the bonds i'd rather watch a pierce brosnan Bond sex scene than any of the I mean Roger Moore and and uh, yeah. Connery like they kind of just seem like old men <laughs> you know <laughs> well um, and um, unfortunately some of those older ones like they uh, some of those scenes are kind of problematic you yeah. know sometimes oh yeah so uh, yeah. so it's it's refreshing that these are you know like it's consensual <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know what I mean yeah um, for sure yeah yeah. No, I, but yeah, I think it's really well shot. Um, and it's like, it's not too egregious. Like, it's not too much, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not, yeah. And it doesn't take away from the movie. Like, it, it feels like it fits, you know? Yeah. Bond, then, I don't remember if there's a, a final scene between he and, and Paris. Um, if it just goes from, uh, I think he just kind of leaves. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. There's no goodbye scene, right? There's, he's just like maybe the next day he's, uh, going to the to back to the same building. It, it's this yeah. Hamburg, you know. Uh, it's Carver's, you know, base of operations, basically. And he's going in to. There's a oh, Paris told him that there's like a secret lab on the. That's right. I forget what floor, but yeah, she, she gives up that information at least. So that's where Bond is going. It's uh, it's a nice little secret lab. Um, yeah. And and there's some good spy work here. He uses the phone that uh, that Q gave him, and we see it do some things that we weren't told. So it's yeah. interesting that there are more uh, useful bits of this uh, gadget than you know the 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 usual trope is like he uses yeah. every single thing that Q gives him for that mission. Yeah. Um, here he uses it but does more with it. Like he, he uses, does even more than he yeah. sold. Yeah. I mean, we know it has a uh, fingerprint scanner and we know it has a, like a shocking system. Um, yeah. I feel Which like he, cool. yeah. Yeah. But he uses them. I think in, in, 
he uses that shock thing uh to unlock the door basically and yeah um i will say uh that is something i kind of miss with the newer like the daniel craig movies mm. didn't have a lot of gadgets and and yeah. they really work for what they are but like yeah. going forward when they do inevitably reboot it i do hope to see more stuff like this because i do too that yeah. was that was on point that was great um yeah and one thing I think the games have really missed out on is they kind of mm. leaned too far into the first person shooter aspect. Yeah. But like, I would love to see like more spy work. As oh, part sure. Of, like missions, like stealth missions where you got to use gadgets and stuff. There was a little bit of yeah. that in the old 64 Goldeneye game, but like okay. not much, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And that's one of those things that, um, to I me, mean, he is a spy. I do spy shit. You know? <laughs> right. Um, this movie felt like it, it, I'm surprised there wasn't a GoldenEye esque, you know, mm. Tomorrow Never Dies game because yeah. there's so many locations. the The Arms Bazaar base at the beginning, for sure, would have been a great location. Oh, yeah. this this whole you know this location, the Hamburg, uh, I don't know what you'd call it. it. It's it's a print factory, and it's like the you got the recording booths. It's like his. It's everything here at this one location. But you could Definitely. use just the print you know yeah side, that'd be a good yeah. the the place where they have the party like you could use the this is a couple different levels also um, for like multiplayer i could just see yeah. it like it that game makes itself for sure yeah yeah there's a <laughs> I lot would love of... to play as carver <laughs> <laughs> right you know that yeah crazy suit yeah um uh, but yeah throughout this whole movie i think there's a lot of good locations that could have been used in a golden eye type game um oh definitely especially when we get to like vietnam like that that yeah uh, skyscraper office sure with, like all the chinese yeah. um artifacts and stuff that was the really streets cool. of uh wherever waylin's base was yeah you know. somewhere um, in vietnam i think yeah yeah um so uh, one thing i like is that bond's got these you know he's got his gadgets he's in this office he's sitting down at like the chair in i guess gupta's uh office and he's just yeah. taking a moment he's like where is that damn thing that I'm looking for? You know, like where would it be? And he looks over at a framed, you know, painting or something. And he, then he opens it up, finds the, um, I think he somehow also uses the phone. Well, this is where he uses the, uh, the ID scanner or the thumbprint right. scanner. Yeah. But I like that. There's a moment of him. Like he figures this out on his own. You know, it's yes. not, uh, I don't know. We don't often get stuff like that uh, where you see that, Bond a little bit of detective is work. a little bit of detective work. He is pretty intelligent. He's, yeah. you know, no, totally. Yeah. He's now he's thinking with his Walter, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but um, the, the safe scene is interesting. Cause like, <laughs> yeah, it's just stock full of like cash drugs and porn. And mm -hmm. then there's the MacGuffin. <laughs> yeah. 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 The inclusion of, of porn was an interesting like, yeah, I guess that's what they're they, they want us to know who Gupta is. Yeah, you know? that's some character I, development. For yeah, him, I guess. Yeah, I uh -huh. guess. Um, and then it, it turns into an all out action scene. You know, Bond gets discovered. Well, he is trying to get out and Wei Lin comes in and she trips the alarm and the yeah. two of them are, you know, she's evading him. You know, obviously she's not trying to get get caught and. You know, right. Bond gets in a firefight with you know dozens of uh, of goons, and that leads into like the printing press area of of this. Totally. Uh, it, it's Which, like, go ahead. I mean, that's a pretty good action scene. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. good location, definitely something we hadn't seen before. Um, yeah, you know, those massive rolls of paper that was kind of interesting. Yeah, um, but I always feel bad for the henchman that gets like churned up in the <laughs> machine. Yeah, like. That was just some like like low paid security guard probably. Right. He was just doing his job and Bond, you know, fucking murk the guy. <laughs> <laughs> um it, the, and that comes with a great, you know, Bond one liner. You know, he oh, tosses yes. the guy into the printing press and then the paper's all streaked with blood and yeah. and he says, "Oh, they'll print anything these days, won't they?" Yeah. <laughs> I like that one. That um, is a good one. That is a good one. Again, like there are some good lines, but I just think less is more because like he, mm. he quips like every single time he kills yeah. him in this movie, it seems. Yeah. Uh, then Bond just ca casually drives to his uh, back to the hotel. He gets a call from Carver, who's threatening him, I believe. 
Mm. Uh, I think he even may say, you know, say, say goodbye to my wife or something like that, yeah. indicating that it's pretty ominous. You know, yeah. So he he races back to the hotel, uh, finds and, good. Oh, I, I was gonna say this feels like a good callback to Goldfinger in a way. Mm. Obviously, without the paint, but like, yeah, yeah, the frame, yeah, and stuff. I wonder if they tried anything like that, you know, because I am without necessarily covering her in something, but right. you know, she is laying down face down, I think, on the bed, and I'm almost curious if they thought about putting her just in the same position as mm. as uh, the lady from Goldfinger, because I think they did that with um, Quantum of Solace. Quantum. Um, like I think oil. she was even in the same position, so yeah. Um, might have been nice to see a little yeah continuity there just a just a, a nod but i think this also works you know as a nod um For sure but uh yeah then we have uh vincent chevelli in a yeah. in a very weird it's a choice he, it, it he's he's too iconic yeah as a that guy i think for for bond he he just yeah you know he he stands out <laughs> And this scene, yeah, it kind of breaks the movie for me. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, it feels like he's an Austin Powers character. Yes, you know? he's yeah, so over the top. Yeah, in a movie that's already kind of like pushing that limit, you know, and like the main villain's mm-hmm. already like you know chewing every scene. Yeah, you know? and this guy comes in and it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> mm-hmm. It it's it doesn't really it, it this takes me out of the movie because yeah. it's like. That's the guy from Ghost, you know. Right. Um, <laughs> I don't know. He's he does some other, you know, good stuff. He works well in Batman Returns. He's like the organ grinder, you know, guy. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. That was creepy. <laughs> yeah. But some yeah, Batman for too. some reason, yeah, he's just <clears throat> just doesn't work for me in, in this. But I like the idea that's that's happening here that um you got this guy who's all into torture and and you know, getting things out of people, you know, they need, they need to know where the, uh, where the MacGuffin is. And that's why he's, that's why he's, he's killed Paris. Um, and he's going to kill Bond, but he's going to get, you know, this information out of him first. Uh, we've, we even see that Bond has already put that device in the uh, glove compartment of the car. That's right. And then, yeah, so this scene, it, it kind of goes from, from this hotel room to the parking garage where you've got the same geriatric you know, group of henchmen <laughs> are trying guys, to, right? yeah. to break into the car and having no luck there, you yeah. know? And again, like Stamper is near, like he's on a, a roof adjacent to this. So he's not like, he's not failing with his henchmen, but he's still like in control and ultimately yeah. like, again, failing overall as, as a, leader <laughs> it's, it's a <laughs> yeah. weird thing for for your main henchman to to be doing um but yeah no that's a good point i hadn't really thought about that i mean it's kind of clever that he doesn't really face off against bond yeah. until towards the end but like yeah. it is weird that he's not really involved at all considering yeah. he's the henchman you know he's not the main yeah. villain he's yeah you know, so like why is he like you know and, stepping and back, maybe you know? Maybe it's it's I'm getting more of that Red Grant vibe from from Russia with Love, where like totally. they don't meet until the end of the movie, but right. Red Grant has been a presence. You know, he was there several exactly. times. You know, clearing the way for Bond, even in some oh for sure cases. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's what they're doing here. Yeah, not as effective as from Russia with yeah. Love, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do like the one thing I I really like about. Uh, Vincent Chevelli's torture character here, Doctor Kaufman, I think is Kaufman. Ka- yeah, yeah. Um, they they're having no luck with the car, and so they call Kaufman and you know say, <laughs> "We need the, we need to get into the car. How do we get into the car?" Yeah. And he's so he even says like, I- "I'm so embarrassed." This this yes. you know, again, what is like, what is funny, the code but... for the yeah. Like what is the code fit. to get in the car or something like that? He, he's so embarrassed with having to re- relay a phone message from the goons <laughs> to to Bond. Yeah. So that that is a nice touch that I, I really liked. Um, sure. But that gives Bond the opportunity to zap him with the phone and uh, t- 
take over the situation and does a brutal headshot to uh to Kaufman. Oh, yeah. Like has him like basically on his knees, like gun just pointed at him at him. And yeah. the the clever thing here is that Bond walks in, he hears that there's a, a news, you know, news broadcast saying that Paris Carver was found in her hotel room with yeah. another man with, you know, and so I go, although that's on a, obviously on a pre-recorded uh, videotape, um, that's what would then be released to the media. So I like that Bond carries out that, you know, that news report, you know, he, by, yeah. by shooting gooped uh, Kaufman in the head, making it look like a suicide. That's, had that tape then gone to the public, it it yeah. would still hold up, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, I you know, I I do think that it is a little weird that we kind of move on from this pretty quickly because mm -hmm. it seems like Bond like really had like an attachment to her. Yeah. But it also kind of makes sense with like the plot. We got to get keep going. You know. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? On how they handled that? Like, because it felt like Brosnan was doing a good job emoting mm -hmm. the scene. But, uh, it's very much like he's kind of forget about her by the end of the movie. You know? Yeah, he's very angry in the moment. He clearly kills Kaufman at purely out of anger for Paris. But then, yeah, yeah really, once you leave this scene, it doesn't seem like Bond really thinks about Paris anymore. You know, it, yeah, you know, in a few minutes, he'll be goofing off and having fun with a car chase in the parking garage, you know, and smiling and laughing about it. Right. You know? that, see, so, that's what it is. Yeah. The tone uh, is like kind of all over the place in this, yeah. this section of the movie, you know, it feels but, like this maybe should have had a little bit more weight or came back up later, like right. him reminiscing about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, the 90s. But this is, this is one of my favorite car, ch car chase sequences in a Bond movie. It's, different because bond's not driving i mean he is but he's not in yeah. the driver's seat you know he's able to play with the, the whole gadget of this car being remote controlled i think really works here mm. um the the choreography of it i think is fun because they can't destroy the car with small arms fire but they prove right. that with with heavy artillery they can they can make dents they can blow out windows and it sets up the perfect, you know, sequence where Bond is essentially playing chicken with a guy with a bazooka and yeah. he fires it and it goes through the car because the they've window. because they've already broken the yeah, front and rear windows. So it hits the car then behind Bond. Like stuff like that really worked. Um, it's ridiculous, but it is fun. Yeah. You know? Like you can kind of just get caught up in it. It's a popcorn movie at its yeah. finest. You know? Yeah. And the car does things that we we expect a bond car to do but we didn't have to be told that it's got rockets in the ceiling and it has the bmw emblem pops up and it of ha of course has a cable cutting <laughs> device you know that that one part kind of made me roll my eyes pretty yeah. hard uh yeah. because it's like what else would that be used for yeah like it's you know it's like the bat wing in 89 batman having the clippers for oh the sure planes, you know yeah <laughs> i don't really have anything else to say about the car chase i think it ends great with uh i mean bond wrecks the car by you know sending it uh over the off flying off of the parking garage and <laughs> delivering it right back to Avis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, and then he, again, he just like puts the phone away and like, he's so pleased with himself. He smiles. He's like, he had fun with that. So, yeah. Totally. Um, and then we cut to a U.S. air base in the South Asia, I think it says, or South mm -hmm. China Sea, U.S. air base, something like that. I don't know. I, I don't remember where it was, but it was probably like South Korea or something. Might have might been, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't be in China. No. Um, <laughs> but uh, Oh, we get the return of uh, Jimbo. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, J.W. No, right. what's his name? Uh, Jack, <laughs> Jack Wade. Wade. It is, yeah. <laughs> but it's basically the same character. <laughs> it, yeah, it's it's a weird... That's my headcanon. <laughs> yeah. It, I, think we, I think we even talked about in GoldenEye when we meet Jack Wade. Like, A, it's weird that you have Joe Don Baker... Because two right. movies prior to to He's Golden Eye, he once. was a villain. Yeah. Um. And then so you have this new Jack Wade character who I think we were thinking, why isn't this just Felix Leiter? You know, 
right yeah we haven't seen felix in a while at this point we haven't seen him since um one of the license to kill license to kill license to kill yeah because that one he almost died i think he gets his leg cut eaten by a shark (laughs) that's Um, right holy shit and so like in the comics that felix gets his leg chopped off by a shark you know in um the living uh no, live and uh, let die. Live and let die. Yeah, because that's in the books. Yes. Yeah. And so I guess in the comics and in the stories, he comes back later with like cyber, not cyber, not, yeah, he's not a cyborg, comics. but he has like uh, implants yeah. or, you know, uh, robotic, you know, limbs or something like that. What was but that? I, Dynamite? Dynamite comics? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That whole run is great. Yeah. Definitely worth, I definitely recommend reading those. Um. So I guess like, not i guess this is a subtle way to th- to remind myself that these movies do have continuity so for them not to bring back felix is because felix is probably retired because he lost his leg to a shark so he's not yes. you know running around to to help old old jimbo you know um so it's a nice subtle little thing that that does make sense the more you think about it but to me especially for counting that as continuity at this point yeah right so which it's it's kind of a weird timeline it's like it's like marvel comics it's like yeah shifting the timeline because like peter parker was a teenager in the 60s but he's only in his like 30s now right you know yeah so it's like that kind of thing you just kind of have to roll with it (laughs) yeah um and i don't know that that jack wade really contributes anything here he this scene is basically to set up that the device that Bond is carrying, the MacGuffin, he gives it to a guy who's a GPS specialist mm-hmm. who just has to authenticate it. Like, oh, yeah, this 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 proves that the ship was off course and this is where it really was. And here's where the ship would have sank and all that stuff. So just a little bit of exposition from this yeah. sequence, which leads to uh, Bond asking Jack for a favor. And that just puts him in a. Yeah. Like a C-130 or something like that. One of those big planes that he can then jump out of and do a halo dive. Exactly. Which, which, which is... again, we, we have to get the <laughs> explanation of a halo dive, you know? Right. <laughs> exactly. Which we've seen um, a few of these by now, like at Mission yeah. Impossible. And oh, yeah. Even the 2014 Godzilla movie. Yeah. Was it, was it the 2014? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, real quick, I want to note that he, Bond, uh, is in his uniform. Yes. Like official... His commander, his naval commander, uh, which is cool. We yeah. don't see that often. Um, that was no. Cool I, I always like that too. Uh, but it's weird because Jack Wade, who is a military professional, right? Like we're like he's a high ranking official, I assume. He's wearing a dinosaur tropical shirt. Right, this right. Entire scene, and in the next one, which just feels out of place. Yeah, you know? I I don't mind his character, but like you would think that he would maybe wear something different. <laughs> Yeah, especially once they're on the plane. <laughs> like, right. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd have to look into. I'd, I'd love to read a novelization of, with one of these and hear what they, how they describe Jack Wade and like what is yeah. his official position here because it feels for like sure. he's like a liaison for a U.S. You know, like maybe he was. He's definitely former military, and maybe he's just an yeah. island hopping. You know sure beach bum who's like well the U- <laughs> the u.s will call in jack because he knows yeah. bond you know or something like there's there's a definite like unofficial quality about this guy for sure like i would totally watch a jack wade spinoff you yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah um but yeah no maybe he's in the gardener novels i've only read like some mm. of the fleming stuff and like okay. there was a couple newer books they put out um but uh, there was a whole lot of novels during this period, like in the nineties. And I don't know if they connect the movies yeah. at all, but like, probably I not. Like they... I'm betting, I'm betting yeah. Jack Wade is a, a created for, for specifically for golden eye and then yeah. carried over into some of these. So for sure. But I've, I've heard that there's like elements from the newer stuff that they okay. kind of worked into the, into those books. Gotcha. Kind of its own thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and then we get the the halo jump, and um, in the plane you've got uh, the guy who I didn't write down his actor's name, but it's uh, the guy who plays Apone from uh, oh. uh, Aliens, the kind of sergeant yeah. who's in charge of of all the the Marines. That's and he's awesome. the guy who makes that connection. Yeah, that's cool. yeah. I didn't. I mean, until just going through IMDb and seeing 
But uh, yeah, he's he's giving Bond basically the the here's what's going to happen. You're going to jump out of this plane. You're going to have so many seconds of free fall, and then you're going to do a, a real short parachute, you know, uh, jump. I like when he's he's going down. You can see that the fins that he'll use underwater are like strapped uh, to his legs. Oh, yeah. Um, it's something That's I never cool noticed touch. before, but it's like I you know, it, it's just a cool little detail that makes sense, but I never thought about. Definitely. I love the whole concept of this. Like, yeah. Uh, and it leads into another scuba scene, uh, right. which we've gotten a lot at this point. But as far as scuba diving scenes go, this one's not bad. Yeah, they're, they definitely there's a little peril fatigue where the boat is a is on a ledge underneath the water. It, it's yeah. it could go over the edge at any moment that a little bit of that I could take or leave, you know. Sure. <laughs> but yeah. And I had no memory of an underwater scene. So this was all felt new oh, to wow. me. Yeah, I just had no, a lot of these movies run together. So, you know, right. scene like this feels like something we've had in several Bond movies by now. So let's see, what was it? Um, one of the, one of the better more movies had a good scuba diving scene that feels very reminiscent of this one. Yes. Um, oh man, that's going to bother me. Which one was it that? Was... It was the more grounded one. Uh all I can think of with underwater. Four your eyes I... only. Okay. Four your that, eyes only. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, of course. Again, they all run together. Of... But... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when I think Bond underwater, my brain goes to Thunderball and just how boring yeah. that <laughs> those underwater sequences it would are. Be such a better movie if they just cut those scenes down. You yeah. Know? yeah. But the reason those scenes go on for so long is because it was a new technology and they were right. just like, you know, it's like, hey, oh, look yeah. at this. We could film underwater. <laughs> yep. <laughs> or, 30 solid minutes. <laughs> yeah. Scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't yes. stop to think whether or not they should. Exactly. Um, yeah. And then uh, uh, Waylon's here. <laughs> Just, yeah. Um, that was convenient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like that she's here because I like For that sure. they're trapped here. And, and because of the ship is shifting and that knocks everything around a little bit and they have to find a new way to get out. So, yeah. It, uh, I think it helps truncate this scene so we don't spend 10 minutes under, under the water. Definitely. Um, and then she conveniently has a ship, a little boat that, that brought her here, which wasn't around when Bond was yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> dropping in from the sky, but whatever. I'll roll with it. <laughs> yeah, because who knows how long he was underwater, you know. Right. So it, it works. It's fine. Yeah, so they, the, oh, 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 they come up from the water. Uh, you see, she has a boat, and then they're just overtaken by St uh, Stamper Stomper. is there. I think they kill the guy that that is waving to Wei Lin, like her guy on 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 her boat. Um, yeah. So then, yeah, they're taken captive and taken to Thai oh. Thailand or Vietnam. I think it, it's Vietnam. I you know yeah. I always used to think that this whole section took place in China, but it doesn't. Right. Like it's specifically not China, but yeah, I, yeah. I guess it is Vietnam, and 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 Carver has another, you know, a, a base of operations here. Mm. They take him to his like skyscraper, basically. Yeah, um, with his face, on of the course. Front, you know, like... the such a wasted opportunity when they're zooming into this big banner of Carver's image. Yeah. You know, they're zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, and they go almost up to the eye. And yeah. then a wasted opportunity to have that be Just a window. That. Yeah. You yeah. know, and that's where like Carver is like peering out of, you know, just. Th I, that would have been good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's know. a huge missed opportunity. <laughs> but this leads to just, just Carver, just villain monologuing at them, mm -hmm. you know, explaining that, uh, you know, he would, he's going to torture the two of them. Here's a bunch of tools that we're going to do it with. Uh, yeah. Gupta was a student of, of, or no, uh, Stamper was a student of, of, uh, the late Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Kaufman. Yeah. Yes. Um, so all that works pretty well and they get, get away pretty quick. Um, oh yeah. They just jump out the window and yeah. thankfully there's a ledge there, you know, mm -hmm. there's still more roof there. Yeah. Oh, there's a, there's a good star Wars joke in, in here. Where they're oh, going, I missed it. they're going through a bunch of the uh, the headlines of, of some of the papers, and oh. it says the Empire will strike back. Yeah, so, that was it's, good. Yeah. <laughs> um. Then yeah, they they 
the whole banner like stunt it it it's great they leap mm-hmm. out the window they take the uh this banner that's hanging on the building and yeah they just write it down essentially yeah. as it rips and of course it it you know comes up just short but they're able to you know bash each other <laughs> through through one of the windows yeah it was a really fun scene. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, I think this really held up because like the way they shot it, like they're still super high off the ground. So like, you know, it, yeah, the tension like really worked, I thought. Um, but Bond, of course, has to quip again, you know, and that mm. was like, I, I was just thinking if I was way Lynn, I'd be so yeah. annoyed right now, you know? <laughs> um, something I like about that banner stunt is they're both scared. You know, yes. as they're yes, falling, yes, yes. this isn't neither of them are, are just cool and collected yeah. about about any of that. So yeah, that's that's, that's something fun, but it's a last ditch effort that they, you know, yeah, they knew they were dead if they didn't do this. So exactly. And, you know, at, we're going to get a lot more into this, I think. But uh, those two together, like mm-hmm. over the next like, um, well, the rest of the movie, really, yeah. I think they play off of each other really well. Oh, yeah. And I love how they're both like that take charge type. Sure. Uh, and they keep butting heads because they keep trying to do it their way. And well, I they're just... it, perfectly. They're handcuffed together, you know, yes. so yes. that adds to the you know, who's leading this dance, you know, that sort of thing. Exactly. Um, but yeah, it leads into a when they get to the motorcycle, yeah. like they're both trying to get on the motorcycle, you know, trying to get in, front, yeah. you know. And, it, you know, the bike chase is one of those things that this is this movie is known for this bike chase and oh, yeah. deservedly so. It's a good chase. Um, I it, think it uh, held up surprisingly well. Yeah. Um, I was not expecting this to really feel as um, I don't know. It just it felt good. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think it felt it like gets, a modern movie. You know? Yeah. Um, I think it gets even better once the helicopter is introduced to this chase. Sure. Once once they're you know, there's a helicopter involved because before it's just, you know, it's kind of standard motorcycle chase um, Mm -hmm. with a couple Range Rovers and, you know, nothing special about it really. But once the helicopter becomes involved and and that ratchets up the the threat. Yes. Yes. So I think that's why it works so well. And they, they do some fun stuff with the helicopter. It's just with no regard to anything. It just starts to, uh, chop through this like alley or you know little road uh, uh market yeah. you know blades just forcing everybody to to run and and bond and of course are getting like bottlenecked you know yeah so. but if you think about it like i mean it is cool as like an action scene but like logically it doesn't make a lot of sense because mm. you would never do that maneuver piloting a helicopter of course. like yeah it, the chances of you like, you know, wrecking and mm-hmm. dying are pretty high with that. Like it yeah. gets snagged on something easily, which does end up happening. Right. Um, but also the logo of the company is on the side, right? Like, <laughs> wouldn't this be an international yeah. incident? Like he right. would be, yeah, it's just uh doesn't make any sense. But mm-hmm. it's fun. Um yeah. the thing I like about that scene though is that there's so many close-ups of uh Bond and Wei Lin on the bike. Like yeah. they clearly did some of these stunts, right? Like, because you can't fake that. They were on the bike, um, and that was awesome. I thought that was really impressive. I I kind of wonder how they pulled this off because I'm yeah. sure some of the wide shots were stuntmen. But Definitely, like, yeah. Like, yeah, that was that was that was really well done. I yeah. don't know how they did that because some of those uh, maneuvers on the bike were pretty nuts. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, looks pretty dangerous, you know. Yeah. I did think that like as I was watching it, I think one way I would tweak this because mm. I think you could cut out 10 minutes of the movie, maybe, sure. maybe 15, just, yeah, just tighten it up yeah, a little yeah. bit. 90 minutes would be perfect for this movie. Yeah. yeah. And I think because I, I figured out it was, you go from the two of them meet in the, the print press office in Hamburg Sure. And then they meet in the water. <laughs> yeah. So you could have had them meeting in Hamburg and that leading to a motorcycle chase because they're right. both on, on land. And yeah. then you could have them meeting in the water and that leading to them teaming up against the, the stealth sub or Ooh. stealth boat thing. Yeah. So it's like you have them meeting in uh, two different locations and then getting into adventures together. It's like you could, combine some of these things maybe 
definitely. take out a little bit of uh, exposition and, and set up for some of those that may have may not been may have not been needed. I don't know. No, I totally agree. That's a good point. Um, because this this whole bike stunt, you know, it works because the tight quarters, I think, in in Vietnam, but you could do this yeah. in any city, or you could have had the print sure. press in this building that they were just escaping yeah. from. Like that the Why the not? placement of these action set pieces, I think could have been rearranged just to consolidate a little bit, but for sure. No, um, I totally agree. Uh, but, uh then you know, yeah, it leading to Waylin's safe house was another instance where it's like they they're still cuffed together. They're trying to work out this uh, shower, you know, which gets <laughs> yeah. some good exposition. But then then they separate. Yes. She goes to her safe house. Bond follows her. It's like you don't really need that, you know, just yeah. have them go there together. Or I, I did kind of like that that shower scene, though, because like she like kind of pulls one on him and like he yeah, cuffs him to the pipe. And that, that was kind of good. Yeah, because it really establishes that she's, you know, this character that's just not going to fall for bond sure and not you know like yeah. not like a typical bond woman, right you know so yeah yeah i do like that she gets some separation from bond and she goes to her safe house and then she gets an action little oh, set yeah. piece of her own to to showcase kind of her skills as a a, a martial arts you know oh yeah michelle yo kicks yeah. all kinds of ass and that yeah. is a fantastic scene the choreography is great Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, she was a Hong Kong action star at this point. Right. So, yeah, yeah. That was really cool that they worked that in. Yeah. And he shows up, you know, they work together a little bit more. And there's one thing that I re that always I'll never forget. Um, yeah. When my dad and I were in the theater watching this, and they've, it's already been revealed that this is like a secret layer, you know, high tech mm -hmm. computers and, and different things folding out of the walls. And then there's this odd moment where a bad guy pops up and, and Bond says, up on your left. And she hits a button and something hits the guy and knocks him flying across the room. <laughs> and my dad and I were the only two people in the theater that bust out laughing yeah. at that moment. Like, we lost it. <laughs> it's pretty No ridiculous. one else in theater did, you know. So I don't know why yeah. it worked on just the two of us, but. Well, there's like no setup for it. Yeah, like, right. It just happens. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that moment. Yeah. This whole scene might be my favorite um, mm. because it, it feels like one of the classic Q scenes. Okay. It's like Q's lab, but it's like the, the Chinese version. Version, yeah, yeah. Um, it was cool. Um, yeah. You know, all the, the, the arsenal was, was pretty uh, pretty nuts. And then we yeah. get like the watches and it's mm -hmm. like, oh, this one looks familiar. We've made some improvements, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that was cool. And it quickly kind of leads to, yeah, they're gearing up and um, mm -hmm. there might be some tech stuff here where they figure out, they have to look at maps and figure out what coves yeah. uh, 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 Carver's you know boat could be hiding in, that sort of thing. Speaking of that, we get that great part where Bond's like, I'll, I'll you know, send out the message. And then he looks mm. at the keyboard and he's like, yeah, yeah maybe you better. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's all in Mandarin, you know? Yeah. Uh, that was good. No, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. They they end up on a boat, you know, in the cover of darkness, and they're they're kind of scouting out these coves and and pretty also a great location. Oh again. yeah, like, like it, beautiful. Um, yeah, I know uh, for filming, anyway. it it takes them back to Thailand because the yes. the islands are nicknamed the James Bond Islands after they uh, use them with for gun. Man with the Golden Gun. Yeah, yeah. so. I want to go um, there one of these days. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's still meant to be Thailand or uh, Vietnam, but they're using that Thailand location. Um, Definitely. But for the most part, it this is uh, entirely water-based, you know, from here on out. They're in oh, a yeah. little boat and kind of easily find the, the stealth sub who don't see <laughs> Bond and Waylin in their little boat, I guess. Somehow. Somehow, yeah. you know. <laughs> I think they got night know. vision on that thing, right? I don't yeah, know. Really... that that's a little odd, yeah. but they find the boat, the stealth boat, and the stealth boat is based on it's called the the Sea Shadow, the Sea Shadow. I, I was surprised to learn that too. Yeah, yeah, the IX five twenty nine or something like that. It's an experimental stealth ship built by Lockheed, and yeah. um, the the only like the main differences I can kind of find are that when Bond and Wei Lin. Uh, drive their little boat up to this ship and underneath it, 
Mm -hmm. there's areas to step out and there's like a landing on both sides and and those landings have doors that lead into the ship that's that's all made up for the movie but overall uh, otherwise it's it's very close to the real uh boat i i suspect this one is is larger because it has an interior set that ha- it's almost yeah, like it's like a whole a, warehouse yeah exactly it, it, probably more like a submarine in the real thing you right know? oh yeah tight quarters and yeah. yeah yeah this one has big open spaces so it makes for a great like uh final um uh what do you call it like a final fight kind of location set like, piece yeah set, the whole set piece they use it well i think i think so i i get a little confused about the geography of this thing, because yeah. <laughs> when they go underneath it, mm-hmm. obviously there's a ceiling above them. But right. then later in the movie, there's a, a spot where there's just an open area of water. So I, I guess that yeah. means that there, though it that is in the drill location. Drill so I guess yeah. that's they have an opening that they can lower the drill from. It's just sure they don't feel like they're like. Part of the same, you know, boat, I guess, but it yeah. kind of works, I guess. But again, back to the game idea, that would have been an amazing yes. location, you For know, sure. especially with the water opening. Like, yeah. oh man, that would yeah. be great. You have to zip line across the, the opening. I mean, opportunity. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, this is one of those where they, they almost just could have planted these, these, uh, grenades or mines on the boat and, could have just driven away right then and there, you know, it almost just sink this thing, right, you know, right here not? and right now. But it's like, they take just long enough. They get <laughs> spotted on camera for uh, Carver spots them. Yeah. Sends henchmen out to, to grab Wei Lin, you know, then that becomes, you know, creates a, a hostage situation situation for, for bond to deal with. So definitely, you know, and, and that totally works really well. They, he, uh, bond gets a, some you know red shirt kind of bad guy uh, yeah. uh stamper like thinks he shoots you know bond when he that shoots was that brutal. guy yeah like, he took a knife to the guy's chest right. and then uses him as a prop yeah <laughs> as a decoy that was it was smart but also like mm-hmm. like what a psycho <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> you know like he's yeah. cold-blooded i mean that is who that character is absolutely so it makes sense so yeah. it was good to, it was kind of good to see that because we don't get that much of that in the brosnan era right but yeah, that was cool. Weird um, moment with uh, with Carver as you know. I think they, they he they bring Waylin to him, and she tries some to get out of I think being held, and 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 Carver just does some really culturally inappropriate, you know, yeah, uh, yikes. mock mock uh, uh, martial art moves and and makes you know the the noises and it just really yeah. really weird choice there but that part didn't age super well no it also makes it does kind of make sense for his character because he's pretty douchey oh like, sure yeah um yeah you know that that is one of those things that kind of dates the movie i guess so yeah it wasn't great yeah um pretty cringy yeah um and then we get uh i think this is kind of where the 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 British and you know the the Admiralty and M show back up. You know it's like it's like oh yeah, there M's in this movie. I, it's been so long since I've seen M. Yeah. Um, but of course, their time's running out. They're almost down to the wire. It is great to, to see uh, the MI6 mission control uh, mm-hmm. set again. I mean that was just cool. You know, yeah. The, the, they used it really well, and I I kind of wish the other movies did that more. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we've got the, I think it's the HMS Bedford, I think is the, that sounds right. The, Bradford or Bedford? I thought it was Bedford. Probably Bedford. Um, I think only because I was looking through the IMDB and the guy who plays the, and the Admiral on like, um, uh, it's, he's one of the, the villains from, uh, last crusade. One of the oh, Nazis. Really? Yeah. He's oh, like okay. the, he's in the tank. Yeah. Um, oh, he's he's okay, one yeah, of yeah. the the main bad guys in Last Crusade. The guy that goes over the I think the so, yeah. <laughs> and um, it's him. He's the admiral, and, and on IMDb it lists him as HMS Bedford Admiral because they they have Makes got sense. several ships in this movie, so they they sure. they refer to him as like that's his uh, title. So awesome. Um, yeah. Um, 
Again, should have written down his name, but it didn't. <laughs> there um, are a lot of like surprising connections with this one, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a uh, Brendan Coyle from Downton Abbey is is in one of these these yeah. boat scenes. Uh, like I said before, uh, Gerard, Butler. Gerard Butler. Like there's Butler there's tons surprise. of people yeah. uh, in this movie who would later you know go oh. on to have. And Anthony Hopkins was almost in this movie. Yeah, uh, I don't know. We had, I don't think we had mentioned that yet. Um, he was as Carver, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, he was apparently frustrated with the constant script changes and the fact that things were so chaotic because they yeah. wanted to get this movie out so soon. And he ended up leaving the project, and that's why he was in Mask of Zorro. Right. Like he wouldn't have been in that movie otherwise. And I, I think it worked out perfectly because. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I really love him in that. So yeah, I I'd liked I I wish there was a reality where we had Anthony Hopkins in a Bond movie and a Bond in villain, Mask of yeah. Zorro. But yeah, if they if they couldn't both happen, yeah. I guess I'd take him in Mask of Zorro. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, he's it, great in that movie. It's been a long time since I've seen it, but thinking yeah. about it now, it's like I don't know. Maybe you'd find a an appropriate Mexican actor to play. <laughs> Oh, you know, fair Don enough. Diego, you know, like that's maybe, a good point. Maybe, you know, it's I, been a minute since I've yeah. seen it. I totally forgot. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. It's kind of like uh, Sean Connery playing the Spaniard and sure, uh, Highlander. It's just, right. What a choice. Yeah. <laughs> Technically, he's playing an Egyptian, which doesn't make it oh, much better, yeah. but <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it's baffling too. It's yeah. Highlander, he's Scottish. Like, right. anyways. That's a whole another yeah, conversation yeah. about another movie that you've already covered, I'm sure. But no, you uh, know what? That came up recently. No, yeah. we didn't cover Highlander, and I oh, don't know okay. how we we overlooked it in our list. Eh, we should have, but we didn't. So yeah, well, you've got a lot of movies ahead of you, so yeah. I understand. Totally. Yeah, we are going to um, do Mask of Zorro, though. We are going to oh, do okay. the Zorro one. So yeah, yeah, especially that one. I think yeah. would be worth covering. Um, but. Anthony Hopkins would make an excellent Bond villain. I think he would have been a very different character in this. Oh, sure. You know, so that yeah. would have been interesting to see. Yeah. Um, somehow in this uh, ratcheting up, you know, climax of the movie, this is where the uh, the 100 year broadcast rights in China comes up. I, I don't know how this uh, <laughs> comes about. Like somehow he just made this deal with China. General Chang is, is brought up like when, right. when Wei Lin is in one of the facilities, she sees a Chinese general. So that's what, you know, clues us in, I guess that the Chinese are maybe making deals with Carver. So yeah, yeah that, that somehow comes up here. And that um, again, just takes me to, Carver's motivations and and this his whole legacy and all that stuff just doesn't really work for me coming from yeah. a like I said 60 year old man well but, it feels like we missed out on some plot details with that because it was yeah. just like a throwaway line I almost wonder is there an alternate version of this movie for the Chinese market that maybe mm. had more to do with that because that's what they do a lot of times today right with movies because of the way yeah you know that maybe you know international uh audiences that that whole thing's really interesting because like sometimes you'll end up like with like three or four cuts of a movie for different demographics yeah. so i don't know hmm. um and this is where uh, i think bond got the word out that this is all happening and and they're trying they, they realize that there's a a you know another boat in the mix because we almost have we have the 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 bedford and we have the chinese vessel mm. and or maybe it's just the china mainland but um they kind of they're they're now they understand that carver is a presence here and he's got a vessel here they can't see it they know it's there um but then the bedford just starts shooting (laughs) just kind of blindly like trying to battleship yeah yeah yeah. um so i dig all that and then of course they you know i i feel like bond somehow helps uh clue them into uh Mm. where exactly the boat is and they they hit it and then it then it shows up or no maybe bond sets off an explosion that then reads on their radar. Yeah, I think um, that's what it was. Yeah, I think it's where he Bond he had sets that up little grenade in yes. the jar. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And with the conveniently placed like the explosive uh, He's got the canister. watch. Yeah, that's what he it was. Puts the watch in there and some you know the timer with that is going to set off something to break the glass which then uh, activates the grenade. Um yeah. he takes uh, Gupta 
hostage, kind of has a standoff with uh, Carver, who has Wei Lin. And I like that Carver is like, you know, point blank, just tells, asks Gupta, like, have you completed your task? Mm. And Gupta's like, yeah, yeah. All you need to do is hit the button or something like that. And uh, so, yeah, he, he outlives his uh, usefulness and yeah. you know, Carver just takes him out. So that yeah. works. Totally, totally. R.I.P. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot of gunfight, gunfire in this movie, uh, in this this location. A lot and, of dual-wielding machine guns. <laughs> and a lot of, like, things in the boat getting hit, but doesn't cause any problems no. until uh, Wei Lin gets a hold of a, a gun and purposefully shoots a panel. And mm. that, like, forget <laughs> what... Uh, I think that one halts the ship. Like they, they can no longer outrun any of the, the fire that's being fired at them from mm. uh, the Bedford. Like, you know, so it's like a lot yeah. of random stray gunfire, but it only mm. matters when, when uh, it it's purposeful. To. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I don't know. That is one thing that like, I don't love about this era of bond is mm. I kind of prefer, you know, he's got the one pistol like with the silencer, yeah. you know, instead he's like just like sh- like wasting bullets like crazy with like multiple machine guns and stuff. And that's probably because of Goldeneye, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if that, I don't know, you know, first person shooters were mm-hmm. starting to become a thing at that point, you know. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Duke and, Nukem and Doom and all that. Yeah. <laughs> Again, th- yeah, this would like, be a great. got to market it to that audience, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I forget. I wrote down a note that the rocket launcher is great improv, but I don't know what that means now. I don't remember. A... Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I mean, Bond like sees like that. There's this like heavy artillery, and he's like, "Oh, I can use that," and then he aims it. But I feel like it's kind of dumb because that would just like blow up the whole freaking boat at that yeah. close range, you know? <laughs> yeah. For the most part, I mean, it, it's all just chaotic and uh, Carver's still like holding out hope for this uh this rocket that they're trying to launch i have no um, idea why at this point because like yeah, yeah it seems like yeah, yeah 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 um but but again he's delusional he thinks he's gonna live forever sure you know? <laughs> yeah uh there's a great moment between bond and uh and carver like they get their little yeah. face-to-face kind of finale and uh it, it's a gruesome death oh, yeah. for for carver he gets that drill like bond just activates the drill and uh sets it on carver it's it's I, it's, it's a lot i like it it's it's up there with like the what was it the license to kill death with uh del toro where he sure chopped up but <laughs> I, I it was kind of lame that they cut away i think i feel like you didn't see any blood or anything yeah you know i feel like yeah but then again it probably would have been rated r if they oh yeah really yeah. shown that because it oh it's brutal to think the about, implications you know? <laughs> yeah it's almost this. worse to not see it yeah, yeah. <laughs> because of the implications yeah um <laughs> And then you get, uh, you know, it, it, this is another one of those where it seems like they always flip flop. It's either Bond will take out the henchman and then take out the the ultimate bad guy, and then yeah. some he'll take out the the main villain first and then deal with the henchman. So this one went, yeah, you know, point. main villain, and then he still has to deal with uh, Stomper, who somehow is like uh, invulnerable to pain. <laughs> it seems uh, again, it feels like they edited something out or something yeah. uh, I, I know in the next movie they will have a a, a right. villain henchman who is involved in this whole thing that yeah, yeah. um because bond stabs him like in the kind of the shoulder with a knife and stamper is just like notice. yeah it doesn't care <laughs> maybe he's running on enough adrenaline who knows but you know yeah. steroids um yeah but yeah. gets his foot pinned against this rocket which is set to go off and and Bond conveniently uh, puts the fuses for their bombs mm-hmm. on the rocket thruster of the of this missile, so that when they fire, it'll set off all the the mines that they rigged up around the ship. So yeah, uh, mutual. Kinda, yeah, I I think it mostly works. I feel like I think uh, so. You know, again, like it's probably because this whole movie was like you know just a chaotic mess behind the mm-hmm. scenes. But, uh, you know, I, I feel like the last, like, 20 minutes maybe could have been chopped a little bit. Yeah. You know, it does go on a little bit long for what it is. For but sure. overall, I like it. It reminds me a lot of the what I the scenes that I loved in Spy Who Loved Me yes. uh, were the 
enemy sub base with you know a big room with bunches you know a lot of places to to have these firefights and you know swinging oh, yeah. on chains you know across yeah. the, the these chasms and um uh, army versus army kind of like good guy <laughs> army versus yeah. bad guy army like scenes like those in in some of the earlier ones like that's what this reminds me of that I don't think we had in a in, for several movies oh. really so yeah this kind of felt- harkened back I think to to some of those totally agree yeah. like like kind of like a more grounded take on that slightly yeah. grounded i don't know it was still pretty over the top but yeah, yeah they are on a sub <laughs> stealth boat yeah thing yeah like stealth boat thing that drill um, weapon and yeah yeah but uh yeah i mean once the the stealth boat you know it basically all blows to hell there's um bond is able to then save uh waylin who's you know in the water and uh yeah, then they have a nice little final couple moments together on the wreckage of the boat, and they're being searched for. Um, but nice little, uh, like they haven't been romantic, no. you know, so far. And but this, I think, feels appropriate enough. Like it works, you know, as far as like them having a final kiss kind of thing. Yeah, it doesn't ruin it for me, but like yeah. there wasn't any build up to that at all. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, maybe a yeah. little bit of banter kind of back and forth, like chemistry. Mm-hmm. But like um, uh, the thing I love about it is that it's like one of the old Connery movies where it ends with him and a girl <laughs> on a boat. Yeah. It's the wreckage of a boat this time. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of a clever nod, you know? I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's Tomorrow Never Dies, really. Um, that is Tomorrow Never yeah. Dies. So, uh Yeah end of uh tomorrow never dies and uh let's uh let's go through the uh the most let's do most heroic first sure i believe there's a hero in all of us i just finally know what i have to do that keeps us honest i'm here to fight for truth and justice in the american way gives us strength you will give the people of earth an ideal to strive towards makes us noble and I know in my heart that it's right. So I really like Michelle Yeoh in this. I mean, I like her in everything, um, everything, everywhere, all at once yeah. is great. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, she's she's good. She's great in Star Trek Discovery. And I think she's really good in this movie. Uh, she's definitely one of the better Bond um, women. Uh, she's a great character. And honestly, I'm kind of surprised they didn't bring her back in the later Brosnan movies. I know there was plans at one point that got scrapped to do like a spinoff movie. Mm. I think that would have been really cool to see. Who knows if that would have been any good, but she's right. great in this movie. And I, I think all of her scenes are a highlight. Uh, yeah. Specifically um, the fight scenes, uh, the uh, the scene with her on the sub, sorry, the stealth boat. Yeah. Uh, the hallway fight where she's just beating the crap with this guy. And then she has like the shurikens she throws oh, at yeah. the dude. And it's it's really good stuff like she's just an unstoppable force in this movie and um <laughs> i i was i've always been fascinated by that character and it's like why haven't we gotten more of this you know yeah um missed opportunity for sure yeah if they could get the rights to just the name of this character you could do you could still do mm-hmm. oh yeah uh, a spinoff movie with her uh just later in life like yeah why you not know, she's yeah. a retired <laughs> secret agent for china but she's got to do one sure. more mission like yeah i could that see that would a... be amazing yeah yeah um i i think the only issue of course with that is that they've rebooted the bond movies since then, yeah and then are about to reboot them again so yeah it would be kind of a weird tie-in but yeah otherwise yeah that would be cool yeah um i mine you know i think the opening sequence where bond defeats everything at, at this russian or this you know terrorist arm bazaar and yeah. At, at one point they say if these nukes go off it'll be it'll make Chernobyl look like a you look know, like a picnic or something. Something. Yeah. So yeah. to me like thinking about it like just just in terms of how many lives are saved I think you know yeah. I think that would would be mine um though what they show us on screen is that this whole base that they're on seems very remote <laughs> so there's no remote. there's no real like th- there doesn't feel like there's imminent danger we're told there is because of the, right. the scale that we're given but you know i think we- i agree with you but um i was kind of wondering about that like i mean what kind of nuclear weapons are these is this like a czar bomba 
because if that's the case then then you're talking like radiation like okay. hundreds of miles out so, yeah. yeah even if it is remote like and it would like just be uh ecological disaster yeah. if that's the case so yeah I for, yeah i think the wikipedia for this movie i think indicates that they're nuclear scud missiles oh okay but uh, maybe i don't, I don't know bad. i don't know though <laughs> yeah i don't know yeah but I mean, we're told it would be devastating, so I just gotta yeah. roll with it. Yeah. It is an excellent action scene, regardless. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could you could almost take that opening sequence and, and expand it and turn that into the mm -hmm. whole movie. You know, yeah, definitely. with him having to stop. I mean, it, it would just be Bond stopping a nuclear device, which sure. he's done plenty, but yeah, it works, I, I'm always so. down for that. Yeah, yeah, it works in Mission Impossible as well. You know, yeah, <laughs> like. Yeah. That is a good threat. Um, it yeah. feels kind of real world in a way, you know. So. Mm -hmm. um, so, how about most villainous? This planet, these people, they are nothing to me. You were made to be ruled. The universe is power. You unstoppable power. Come to me, son of Jarrell. Kneel before Zod. And I am that force. I am that power. In the end, you will always kneel. Kneel before your master! That's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> you know, can I say that it's kind of a tie? Of course. There's two specific scenes that really jump out to me. There's the one where Carter is unveiling his, his plan for world domination. He even says it. Yeah. Like, to everyone that you know mm -hmm. for the whole world uh he's unveiling yeah. his 24-hour news cycle um but i like that it's while bond's getting the crap beat out of him mm. like during this fight even that's going on in the background they keep cutting back and forth that was kind of clever uh but i also really like the scene where they're in his tower and he's all monologuing about what's about to happen like yeah. stomper's gonna go to town on you with these like just yeah. awful looking devices. This like, one pulls your heart out while it's beer. Yeah. Like that really creeped me out as a mm. kid. And it's still kind of like, oh yeah. Cause like you don't see it, but like just, just seeing the, like the blades on those things. Right. Like, it's really gnarly sounding. <laughs> mm -hmm. So th I, that's probably the one, you know, Okay. <laughs> that's probably yeah, right on. the moment. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was the, it was the implied torture and murder of of paris you know just that yeah. bond finds finds paris dead and you know we don't know what kaufman yeah. did you know before killing her i mean so but i think it's That's implied kind of i think he, kaufman says you know something of, of, mm. to to imply that she was tortured you know oh, before he killed awful. her yeah, yeah uh so that that's and then sadistic. that yeah like that to me it was just because you know Car elliot you know sent Kaufman there to do this. So yeah. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> well, uh, let's get into like, just what are your overall thoughts? Kind of sum up how you feel about the movie and what you'd rate it out of five. Sure. Um, so yeah, overall, I mean, I enjoy this movie. It's mostly nostalgia, I think, I think, but the, it, it did help hold up, uh, surprisingly well, as far as a bond movie, I do think it's kind of mid tier. I don't think this is a top 10 for me but it's, it's not a bad one, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that makes it sound meh, but it is, it is yeah. good. It's entertaining, which is important, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, you know, uh, Michelle Yeoh's great in it. The, the cast does a pretty good job. There are moments where it's a bit cheesy, maybe cheesier than it should be. Uh, less is more with that with me, you know, yeah. like I like some of the one liners, but the fact that Bond, like half of Bond's dialogue is one liners is a bit much. Um, <laughs> at least that's how it felt. Yeah. Um, I felt like the tone was a little all over the place. And if you chop this down to 90 minutes, it's a way better movie. Right. But I like it. I still enjoy it. <laughs> it sounds I like know. I didn't with all those complaints, but yeah, no, it's, it's no golden eye in my book, but okay. you know, yeah. Um, you know, I went into this one with very low expectations based on reputation. It had been long right. enough since I'd seen this one that, you know, to me, it was just, oh, it's one of the Brosnans that isn't Goldeneye. So it must right. be pretty low on the list. Right. Mm -hmm. I had it look pretty low on my ranking of, of Bond movies just based on 
Mm-hmm. Like, oh yeah, I think that one was probably down here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so with, you know, kicking it off with that opening sequence that I absolutely loved, you know, brought me to a high point, Yeah. you know, very early on. And then that high point never really lowered that much. Mm. I mean, there it dipped a little bit here and sure. there. And like awesome. I said, you know, you could cut out 10, 15 minutes of this movie, you know, Jonathan Price is, is pretty cartoony as a villain, but yeah. he's still pretty enjoyable. Um, you know, the movie itself is is kind of it's a copy of of other Bond things, but what Bond movie isn't copying right. other Bond movies? I mean, <laughs> they did the same exact plot between like Thunderball and Moonraker and um, you know, the uh Spy Who Loved Me and for your eyes only like they're all the same plot you know right no, um totally. so this just feels like elements of those movies kind of being redone with with a new bond or you know but i i don't that's not a downside no. for me really you know um so same. all that like you know i do think terry hatcher was a little wasted you know they could have mm-hmm. like we said they could have she was great could have had yeah. her more i i would have liked her in the movie a little bit more I think if they had like made her like a like the main love interest, mm-hmm. you know, I, honestly, they didn't really need the love angle with her with him and Waylin. Yeah, but like she was, I felt like there was something there, you know. Um, yeah, and they did something interesting with her. It's just, yeah, I, yeah, that was one thing where I felt like they did do her character. They did yeah. her character a little disservice by kind of writing her out of the movie so early on. And stuff, right. Yeah. Yeah, just she was kind of just there to, as motivation for Bond, but not really because he was still yeah. on the case. You know, he wasn't right. You know, it, it so it and it, yeah, it is kind of like a terrible trope at this yeah, point, too. Yeah, like, so that you know, so that, that's yeah, not great, but knock some points off for that, I guess. They yeah, yeah, um, but this one, like, like I said, I, I, I was at a real high with it throughout the movie, it never really got went down that far, and um, this one rose in my overall like uh, ranking of Bond movies. You know, I have a list of all of them ranked, and this one jumped up several spots. Nice, and it's in the top ten now. It's number ten, is it? But oh, it's okay. in my top ten. Um, <laughs> I ranked I've... them once before. I want to say mine was like twelve for this. Okay, like it's it's up there, but not quite middle. Top 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and it, I put it above uh, Goldeneye. Like in in my really? ranking, I actually like this more than Goldeneye. I wow. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, I'm That's giving it a, a three and a half. You're giving this one a three and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See, uh, that see, the, it, this is a this is tough for me, but I would say a three point nine. <laughs> uh, doing that crazy because, math on me. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um. But yeah. Um. Because it's not quite a four. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, though, GoldenEye is like way up there. That's like almost yeah. a five for me. Okay. So, you know, slightly different scale. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I think we rate, we gave GoldenEye, um, I gave it a, uh, I gave it a three. Patrick gave mm. it a four. So yeah. that, that gave it a 3.5 overall. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think we just kind of weren't feeling some of the 90s-ness of it, maybe, and some it's of the very much character stuff and, you know, the yeah. the main bag or the 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 guy who isn't uh who isn't Sean, Sean Bean, Bean. <laughs> the 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 Russian or German general like he right. was just a nothing character yeah. you know there was just stuff that we just were like eh. sure um, and again that's probably all nostalgia for me at this point right <laughs> like <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah but yeah so I'm at yeah I'm at a three point five you said a you were at a three point nine three point nine sorry to make it complicated <laughs> that's all right. That just feels right, you know. <laughs> yeah, which gives gives this movie a three point seven, which That's, I'm that sounds good. Yeah, I'm happy with. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. It's better than average. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So, Eric, I mean, tell us uh, everything sure. you want to plug. Everything you know, uh, wherever listeners can find you. Sure. Yeah. Well, you guys can find me uh, on most social media platforms at Eric Slater. That's Eric with a K. Slater with the D. D is in Delta. Um, you can, uh, I'm on a few different podcasts right now. Podcasters assemble, which is a movie podcast. Um, we're going through the Indiana Jones movies right now. Um, I've also got Epic Fails of history, history podcast. 
um, and a few other ones. Uh, again, you know, I talk about it on social media, but uh, you can check out my books. My latest one is twenty two ninety nine. It's a sci fi noir, um, and yeah, if you like Bond movies, you'll probably get a kick out of it. Hmm. So check nice. that out. It's on Amazon. I even have the audiobook on Audible. It's great. Yeah, I'll uh, have all the all the relevant links to all that stuff in the show notes. So uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for joining and, you yeah. know, being very flexible with uh, what when we oh, no recorded worries. this and, you know. I try. Yeah. <laughs> you no, know, you're totally good. I understand stuff happens. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sad that Patrick couldn't be here for this one. You know, like I said, this was uh, he's he hadn't missed a bond until till this. So mm. but uh, I'm curious. I'll have to find out what uh, what he thought about this one. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. But, um, uh, and I'm so curious I, to see what you guys think about world. The world is not enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> yeah. don't love that one. Um, there Spoilers are things I like about either. it. <laughs> yeah, I think Robert sure. Carlyle, I think, is used really well, but also not used enough. You know, but also completely wasted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, Sophie Marceau with, uh, is is mm-hmm. good, but maybe like I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah, it's we'll all, see. all over the place. Yeah. Mm. Um, I guess that means that uh, Rob O'Connor wins the uh, which side we we land on as far as oh um, yeah that's right because we I think you know sounds like we both had we had a good time. a good time with this one so yeah um yeah let's see what I can't our... say the same for the next one but <laughs> <laughs> the next Bond yeah yeah um, although what is upcoming on uh, Real Comic Heroes yeah so our next movie will be Dark City. Oh, that's an interesting one. Yeah, I've never seen it. Um, yeah. It was, uh, we had a guest, uh, Riley Silverman. She came on for Batman and Robin. And oh, when okay. we were talking in the green room with that one, she said, you know, are, are you doing Dark City? And, and said no, but she said, you, you might want to. So, yeah. So okay. we, we threw that on the list uh, because of her. And then, nice. So yeah, look forward to seeing dark city for the first time oh. yeah that's i'm curious to hear your thoughts on it it's it's an interesting one i okay. don't want to spoil anything yeah. yeah well all right yeah uh that's gonna do it for this one uh, and um uh, eric again thanks yeah thank you for that's having it. me back it's always fun this is anytime time. yeah but until then stay safe out there citizens thanks for listening to the podcast Find the show on Facebook and Twitter at Real Comic Heroes. All music and audio are the property of their respective creators.